Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this Uganda deep dive, number one, starting off with Entebbe and Murchison Falls National Park. I hope you're all hanging in there, which is uh, an overused cliche these days for us in the travel and hospitality industry, but it always does seem to be the most important, uh, appropriate thing to say. So um, my best to all of you out there and uh, and I hope, um, yeah, I hope you're hanging in there and taking care of yourselves and staying healthy. Give you a little bit of a diversion today for about 35, 40 minutes um, to Uganda, and in particular, it's like I said, to Entebbe and Murchison Falls, which uh, most famous Murchison Falls that is for the shoe bill, which is the picture on your screen there. You can also um, see the shoe bill in the Mabamba wetlands near Entebbe. So for, for those of you that sell birding trips or that have birding clients, um, this is definitely your webinar because Entebbe and Murchison are two of the best places um, in Uganda for birders and have some must-do birding excursions. So for those that I don't know or you don't know me, I'm Tad Bradley from the Kusini Collection. We're the North American sales representatives for Classic Africa Safaris. I'm based uh, in Seattle and I'm actually joined today by Lindsay Harshman who is, uh, works for Classic here, also based in the Seattle area. So you may know her and have been in touch with her um, for any of your quotes and, and, um, and itinerary development and things of that sort. So Linz is gonna join us uh, to answer any questions as well. And she may jump in here throughout the presentation. Um, if you do have questions, please enter them either into the chat or the Q&A fields. Uh, we will likely just get to those at the end shooting for about 35 minutes uh, for the presentation and then we'll do a Q&A afterwards. I am going to turn off my video now because I do have a, a couple of videos to show you during the presentation and uh, it makes it a little bit easier uh, and better for the videos if my face is not up there as well. So, but I did want to give you a little bit of proof of life here these days when we're isolated. It's nice to see other people's faces, I feel. All right, so we're gonna dive right in. Hold on one second, I'm gonna turn that off. Okay, we're gonna dive right into the location of Uganda. For those of you that aren't aware, if you're in the travel industry, I'm, you, you probably are, but uh, Uganda is in East Africa, bordered as you can see there on the map by Kenya, Rwanda, the DRC and Burundi, and right on the shores of Lake Victoria. Zooming into Uganda, uh, Entebbe International, which is the major and the only international airport in Uganda. It's located about 35 kilometers from Kampala, which is the capital, but um, for the most part, you and your guests, we recommend uh, trying to stay away from Kampala just because um, it is a very busy city with lots of traffic. I guess not so much at the moment, but in general, lots of traffic, and it can really be up to a two and a half hour drive from Entebbe into town. While there are some nice hotels in Kampala, we generally, um, if not always, recommend guests just to stay outside in Entebbe, which is kind of a lovely little suburb suburban um, area of Kampala and very convenient, obviously, to the international airport. Um, lots of flights into Uganda in normal times, Qatar, Emirates, KLM, a popular one that also flies uh, through Kigali and Rwanda. So a nice, if you're doing a combo trip, KLM is a good option. And then for combining Southern Africa, South African flies into Entebbe and Kenya also flies in from Nairobi. Visas are required for Americans, either uh, $50 uh, with the online e-visa, which is a super easy and efficient process. Or if your guests are going to be traveling to Kenya or to Rwanda, they can also consider buying the East Africa visa, which includes um, both those countries. But you really would only do that if you're going to be uh, going to all three, because I think it still is a little bit cheaper if uh, you're just doing Uganda and Rwanda just to purchase the individual visas. You do need to have a yellow, uh, yellow fever certificate and it um, may or may not be checked, but I think more than likely after these, these days, it probably will be. And a passport must be valid for six months after your exit date. Just uh, what we're gonna look at today is obviously the Entebbe area and Murchison Falls National Park. The classic safari circuit in Uganda starts as does every Uganda itinerary in Entebbe and then heads up to Murchison Falls. We recommend three nights down to Fort Portal and the Kabali area for chimp trekking, Queen Elizabeth National Park, and usually finishes off with Bwindi. But today we're gonna to focus and deep dive just into Entebbe and to Murchison Falls. 
very quickly on weather and seasons. It's really a year round destination, um, similar weather patterns to elsewhere in East Africa, if you're familiar with Kenya and Tanzania. December through February is the, the dry season, warm spring-like conditions, great for gorillas. You get a little bit of rain beginning usually in March and then April and May is the, the heavier rainy season. Um, it does make trekking, can be make trekking a little bit more difficult, um, but that then again, Bwindi is a rainforest and so there's a chance of rain pretty much any time of year. June through October is your cooler dry season, peak season. Um, you definitely have more visitors that time of year and just generally uh, the wildlife viewing is excellent because of uh, less water around and the wildlife is attracted to uh, the rivers in the various parks and Murchison being one of them. And then November is your short rains, um, a, a great time of year to visit because you typically do get off season rates uh, and you do get a, a, some afternoon showers, but it's, it's not generally as heavy as, as you would have in April and May. That's all of that said, you know, you really can go trekking and visiting Uganda and Rwanda any season. All properties are open year round. Um, so uh, as far as temperatures go, it's really more dependent upon altitude than it is on um, uh, anything else because you are on the equator. So uh, Bwindi tends to be a bit cooler because it's at a higher altitude than say Queen Elizabeth National Park, which is at a lower altitude. So just in general, and then we'll get into specifics about Entebbe and, and Murchison, why would you go to U Uganda? It really is one of Africa's most diverse and incredibly dynamic regions. So many different diversity of activities, diversity of scenery, diversities of species. Um, and in terms of the activity diversity, of course, most people are visiting Uganda to go gorilla and chimp trekking, specifically gorillas is, is the big draw, obviously, but there's also, um, you know, 11 other diurnal primate species. For active safaris, for hikers, um, incredible forest hikes, including in Murchison Falls, um, amazing waterfalls. I won't tell you which one we're gonna look at today. And obviously your trek through Bwindi for those um, hikers is, is a bucket list item. You do also then have traditional driving safaris, which we'll talk about today up in Murchison Falls, as well as in Queen Elizabeth National Park. Um, again, for those active safari goers or active uh, adventurers, there's a wide variety of, of uh, activities outside the vehicle, walking, biking, horseback riding safaris in some of the parks. Two of Africa's great boating safaris, and this is continent wide. And today we're gonna focus on the Nile River and the boating safaris um, and opportunities that you have uh, up in, Queen, in um, Murchison Falls, but then you also have the Kazinga Channel and Queen Elizabeth. And then it is one of Africa's, if not the best, one of the top uh, birding destinations on the continent with approximately 1,074 species that you can twitch in Uganda. And then some very unique cultural experiences, the Batwa around Bwindi and the Karamajong and the Ik up near Kidepo National Park. But it also just is one of those destinations because of the density of populations when you're driving between the various uh, parks, you're gonna really just absorb culture almost by osmosis um, as you drive through small towns and, and small homesteads and farms. And because um, it isn't always known as a first time destination, there are generally fewer travelers. You really do have some pretty intimate game viewing opportunities um, because there are far fewer vehicles around. The parks are generally um, pretty big. Um, you've got an amazing culture, as I've mentioned, accommodations. Uganda not known for its accommodations necessarily, and there are really no, you know, Singita level six, seven star properties, although there are some new, newer ones, and we'll talk about one up in Murches and Falls, which is definitely ticks the five star boxes. And then fantastic guides as well, and, and certainly Classic prides itself on its guiding team. And then recently, in the last couple of years, there's been new flights that have kicked off from both the Mara as well as the Serengeti which make um, connecting uh, Uganda as a gorilla extension on a safari in either the Mara or the Serengeti a lot easier and a lot more simple in terms of logistics. So more on that later and, and in future webinars. Just to uh, show a couple of pictures, I have to be honest, it's, it's kind of tough to find pictures of, of Phil Ward and, and Mel Gormley, the founders of uh, Classic Africa Safaris, but we managed to find a couple. And um, this picture in particular, I love of, of Phil and his family at Mercedes and Falls last year. Uh, Phil and Mel founded the company, I believe in the year 2000 or 2001. Um, both of them have been around the East Africa Safari circuit for 30 plus years. An incredible 
wealth of information and knowledge. Um, Phil was a, was a driver guide himself for many years doing overland safaris all around East Africa. So he's, uh, if he's, he's seen it, it, he really has one of those guys that has seen it all and, and has the stories to prove it. Mel um, is uh, focused right now mostly on the vehicles and on our operations in Entebbe. He is based in Entebbe and Mel is uh, an absolute genius when it comes to putting together the most reliable, the most comfortable, um, and uh, they're really just the most beautiful safari vehicles. And he does it all at our um, machine shop or our vehicle shop in Entebbe. I believe Classic is, is one of the only, if not the only company, safari company that has their own vehicle fabrication shop. And Mel, um, his passion is to create vehicles that are, like I said, very reliable and very comfortable for your guests. And part of that is due to the fact that Uganda is largely a driving destination. Uh, although you can fly and we'll talk about that. Vehicles are critically important to the experience in Uganda because you will be spending some time in them even if you're doing a fly-in safari. And so um, we do t spend a lot of time and a lot of money and put a lot of effort into creating vehicles that are um, very reliable and very comfortable for your guests. You can see the exterior here, land cruisers that have been kitted out with pop tops, sliding windows. The interior is very comfortable, S uh, seat six in the back with their own captain's chair. Uh, also have uh, fridge and power points and air conditioning as well. And uh, we also have recently put to, um, uh, added us a airport transfer vehicle in Entebbe. So your own mini bus here. And guides being critically important to the experience as well. We um, have a number of on-staff guides as well as a little black book of great freelancers that um, would be, you know, that are fantastic and we've worked with for, for many, many years. As far as flying goes, there is more and more options for flying within Uganda um, today, and it does allow you to cut down on the long drives. For example, today we're gonna talk about the drive up to Murchison Falls from Entebbe, which is roughly a seven to eight hour drive, depending on the number of stops you make. Um, and uh, you, can, you can now do that flight. It is a daily flight with a minimum of four packs, um, and you can then continue on flying from Murchison Falls down to Queen Elizabeth National Park and then onward. So flying is a, is a possibility, but more than likely you'd also then be paying for the vehicle to come join you um, because of um, having the quality of guides from Classic, I think is a, is, a must, is a must do. We'll send this information around. This is the Aerolink flight schedule for this year. I'm sure it's obviously not uh, currently flying this way. I've uh, been modified a bit uh, due to the current situation in the world, but um, it's really helpful to see uh, the flight schedules both for Murchison Falls as well as for elsewhere in um, elsewhere in the country. Here's the Murchison Falls schedule. Also just draw your attention here to the Mara and Tebby schedule. All of those flights coming in from the Mara as well as those from the Serengeti are timed to connect to Aerolink flights whether it be to Murchison Falls or to Bwindi or Queen Elizabeth or elsewhere. So you in theory can have your guests start off the morning on the Mara and um, in, th in the afternoon either in Murchison or, or uh, on a gorilla trek in, or not a trek, but in, a, in Buindi and, uh, and get ready for their trek the following day. And Lindsay, we'll, we can touch on this later as well. Um, there's, there's always options. Um, sometimes Aerolink isn't the best option. There's other charter companies as well. And Classic is the experts in how best to, to try to piece together the flights if your guests don't wanna do the drives. Hey, Tad. Go ahead, Linz. Uh, just wanna point out too, um, if you wanna go back to that screen on the flights, the Entebbe Bagungu flight is at noon. So if your clients have come in the night before on say KLM and they're doing a forced overnight in Entebbe, you can have them do, which we will touch on this shortly, Tadwell, um, the botanical gardens in the morning before flying up to Murchison Falls. And it's a really great way to, you know, get up, get moving, stretch your legs and have an activity that morning before going up to Murchison, which is kind of a nice uh, value add. So keep that in mind. Great advice, yeah. This is the kind of good advice you guys will get when you're, when you're connecting with Lindsay about um, putting, piecing together an itinerary. Um, and we will talk about the botanical gardens in a second. We'll first just start with the properties in Entebbe that we generally recommend. The Protea, obviously a Marriott brand. It's literally across the street from the airport. 
very convenient. It is a protea. So if you stayed in a protea elsewhere in, in Africa or a Marriott, you know what, what, uh, you're, what to expect. Um, but it's in this beautiful location right on the lake, as you can see that uh, pool that borders um, the Lake Victoria. Beautiful views out over the lake. Um, if you're in the standard rooms, however, you'll be looking back at the airport. So Classic generally would not um, sell those rooms and wouldn't recommend them. And they don't have balconies either. So we generally um, put guests into the deluxe and premium rooms, which do have the lake views and the balconies. And the, uh, the premium rooms are the, are the newer rooms, um, which I would highly recommend. There are also are 12 executive suites, two junior suites, and a presidential suite. So in this post-COVID or living with COVID era, people wanting to have a little bit more exclusivity, um, there are options there for bigger rooms with more um, with more privacy and, and more exclusivity as well. But it is, like I say, across the street from the airport. So super convenient if you're coming in, as Lindsay was saying, the night before on one of the, the late night flights that arrives in the, in the evening, uh, you're uh, clearing customs in the vehicle and five, 10 minutes at the most later, you're checking in into the hotel. Um, so really convenient for, um, for the airport. That said, pretty much every property, including Karibu here, is very close to the airport in Entebbe. Karibu is uh, very homey, bed and breakfast style, seven rooms. Uh, last time I was there about a year ago, they were, uh, they were renovating an eighth room upstairs. I'm not sure if that's been completed, but again, just a small homey feeling, amazing food. Some of the best food you may have in, in Uganda, um, great breakfast. So again, if your guests are coming in late night, um, they, they'll, they'll keep the kitchen open more than likely to get your guests a, a late night snack if you want, and then you'll have a really hearty, wonderful breakfast in the morning before setting off on safari if they're just doing the one night. It really is a great value as well. Uh, there's a pool, beautiful gardens as you can see. The interiors are comfortable. This isn't luxury. There isn't air conditioning, which really isn't super necessary throughout Uganda because it is pretty temperate. But just to keep that in mind, um, they do have fans, mosquito nets, and then the bathroom is at the back. Um, but like I say, just a really homey, very comfortable bed and breakfast style. Um, my favorite property uh, personally. If you're looking for higher end on the boutique level, um, hotel number five is really the best boutique hotel in Entebbe, if not the only luxury boutique hotel. 10 rooms, you can see here there's an upper floor which has four rooms with lake views and those balconies which would be my recommendation just to be able to see the, the peekaboo peek view of the lake is, is kind of nice. The ground floor has another um, five uh, rooms with a patio. You, you don't have lake views on there. You're looking more at the gardens. And then again, um, for people looking for more exclusivity in these, in these times, there are five apartments which have two floors with a kitchenette and lounge downstairs and bedroom upstairs. And then there's a residence, which is a, a private house, um, which is totally separate, standalone, fully serviced and equipped uh, two bedroom house with then suite um, bathrooms on those rooms, full, fully equipped kitchen. You have a full-time staff with a butler. Um, and it's, uh, it's certainly for your upmarket guests that, that want to have complete exclusivity. That's, um, that's a great option. The interiors are very nice and comfortable. I remember the hotel is having this amazing art collection as well. Unfortunately, this picture doesn't really show it, um, but they have a really eclectic collection of art. I think mostly of Ugandan artists. And uh, that's actually one of my big impressions leaving the hotel was the amazing art collection. As far as I understand, great food. Lindsay might be able to speak to that. I, th I think she's dined there. I, ha I haven't, but good wine collection um, and, uh, and, and pretty good food as well. So there's your, your upmarket boutique option in Entebbe. Um, and, and it does come with a price. It certainly is quite a bit more expensive, expensive than Karibu or even Protea, um, but uh, for your upmarket clients, it's, it's likely the best fit. And all of these properties, the Protea is the closest, um, but Karibu and, and hotel number five, you know, you might be 15 minutes at the most from the airport, 10, 15 minutes. So they're all very convenient to the airport. And um, the best views of the lake are definitely from the Protea because it does sit right on the lake. As Lindsay mentioned, um, a nice activity for your guests that have a little bit of extra time, whether it's they've come in on an early morning flight, which I didn't, there's not a ton of them, um, or if they're coming in the, in the evening and then have a morning prior to going on a flight, or they're gonna spend a whole day in Entebbe for, for whatever reason, the Entebbe Botanical Gardens are a great um, half day excursion, um, guided excursion through these beautiful lush gardens um, with uh, 
you know, really a wide variety of bird species. It's a good place to start for a birding tour, just to, to stretch the legs and, and um, get your eyes a little bit exercise of, 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 for the eyes, for spotting birds. Uh, a lot of unusual plant species and flowers, like the picture on the left. Uh, you also have some primates in the gardens. So just a really nice, peaceful place to, uh, to decompress after a long flight, spend a couple of hours stretching the legs before heading off on safari, especially if you're gonna either do that late flight or if you're gonna be driving, um, you know, nice thing to, uh, to get the legs moving before you sit in a vehicle for a while. Also you on know, the same- I would really quickly say that a lot of people think of botanical gardens as sort of a manicured, you know, English style garden, and they're not. They're very, very wild. Um, a lot of regional and endemic um, flora. And also this is where, um, I don't have the year in front of me, but the, I think it was 1950s version of the Tarzan movies were filmed. Mm. So you have a lot of like the vines hanging down and the light coming mm. through. It's really beautiful. So it is, you know, I mean, if you say botanical gardens to people, um, they might think of something like say Bouchard gardens or whatever. I was just going to say um, Victoria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's just very, it's very, um, dense jungle and it's really beautiful. I love it. I thought it, it's very much worthwhile. And right next to it, and, and part of the same complex is the um, Uganda Wildlife Education Center, I believe is the um, acronym there. And um, we do, there's a, there's a couple options there. You can do a, a short visit. This is um, also known as the Entebbe Zoo, but it really is more than that. It's, it's a, it truly is a conservation center for mostly for young animals um, whose parents had been, had been orphaned animals, whose parents have been killed by poachers more than likely. Um, and they really are all about uh, education as well, not only for visitors, but for the local communities. They do a lot of school groups here. They do do some reintroductions of, of, um, of rehabilitated wildlife. Um, and on, in addition to just your regular visit, which is also usually combined with the botanical gardens, you can do a behind the scenes visit, which gives you access to, well, the behind the scenes, um, the inside view of what happens um, uh, inside the animal, animal care facilities, the animal hospital, the rescue centers, um, and you'll likely be accompanied by an animal keeper, a veterinarian, or some educators from the center um, for that. And then there's also a chimp close-up, a chimpanzee close-up experience, which does have a health requirement. Um, I'm sure will be even more important these days. So you do have to be aware of that. Your guests have to, to pass certain health requirements and prevent, uh, present certain certificates. And, and again, Lindsay and, and the classic team can advise on that. Um, but it gives you a chance to join um, some young chimpanzees. I think it's a morning activity, Linz, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, where you get to go actually interact with the, with the chimps on, on site. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and there's two different, there's the behind the scenes and then there's the up close, as you say on the slide. Um, the up close requires a laundry list of shots. Yeah. I did, sorry, did you just say this? Including um, rabies. I didn't give the specific shots. Yeah, oh, wow. So, so I would really, um, I know there's a couple operators listening right now that have offered that and done that with their clients. And the getting rabies vaccines, not, you know, as a preventative, not as a, as a result of a bite or something, it's quite complicated. Um, so unless you have clients who, for some reason, are incredibly obsessed with this idea of physically interacting with a chimp, um, probably doing the behind the scenes is going to be um, completely appropriate without getting jabbed in your stomach 10 times. Eey, no, thanks. But yeah, hey. And of course, you know, we do, most people that are coming to Uganda are going to see chimps in the wild as well, whether that's in the Badonga Forest in Murchison, which we'll talk about, or in Kibali Forest. Um, so as Lindsay said, it's really for people that do want to, who are, are super chimp um, crazy that this may be um, an experience for them. But we can give you that laundry list of shots uh, after the webinar if you're interested. Then the Mabamba wetlands, as I mentioned in the introduction, Mabamba wetlands, one of the best places in Uganda to see the shoebill. And you can actually see in this photo, here's guest inside um, in the boat here, looking, spotting for shoebill. And there is the little shoebill on the other side of the photo. We'll do a zoom in there. Shoebill, you know, bizarre looking uh, bird for sure. 
Um, I think the sh they call the shoe bill because that uh, the shoe is reminiscent of a Dutch, one of those Dutch clogs, I believe. Um, but the Mabamba Swamp is about a two hour trip uh, by vehicle away from Entebbe um, or a 45 minute speedboat ride. So there's a couple of ways to get out there. You can either, and it's more expensive to do the boat trip all the way from Entebbe. Um, otherwise you do the drive and then go out in the boat uh, to, to, to be you know, spotting shoebills as well as plenty of other birds as well. Um, it's a large uh, papyrus swamp and it really is one of the most important bird areas on Lake Victoria. Uh, this is primarily for those that have a little bit of extra time or for birding groups. If you do have a birding group, it's kind of a must do because it is, uh, it, it will nearly guarantee you combination between Mabamba wetlands and going on the, um, the Nile Delta boat trip in Murchison Falls. We won't say it's a guarantee, but the chances are very high that your guests will, will twitch um, a shoebill um, between the combination of those two areas. So, but again, most people that do this are specifically going out there for birding reasons um, and or they have a little bit of extra time. It is basically, Lindsay, correct me if I'm wrong, almost a full day activity or at least a, a good three quarters of the day just because of the time to get out there, the time on the boat. Yeah, it's usually, um, we try to get out as early as possible because just, I think it's helpful to explain exactly how it works. Um, we don't often do the road transfer. Um, it's, I think if you're gonna be spending money on this tour, you might as well just have your clients go by boat because they get to go across Lake Victoria, which is quite dramatic in and of itself. And what happens is you approach the swamp and you have to exit the, the bigger speedboat and get into a motorized, um, kind of like a Makoro style canoe to go inside the papyrus swamp with a, with a local guide. What happens is as it gets later in the day, more boats have come out and the shoebill tend to just go back into the, into the swamp. And so spotting them is best in the morning so getting out there early is, is really crucial. Um, depending on how keen your clients are um, with their birding, they could take a packed lunch with them. Most people are back and can have lunch in Entebbe. Um, and, you know, it's, it's too long to do before the, the Murchison Falls flight at noon. We can't, we can't fit that in. Um, but if they, you know, they have that overnight in Entebbe, then... Um, yeah, then there's plenty of time. So not quite a full day. Uh, they could do botanical gardens in the afternoon if they wanted to. Got it. Great. Cool. And then um, other activities, there is a craft, uh, in Tebe craft market, as well as a local market if your guests would like to go shopping for crafts. The craft market is, I think, generally considered to be pretty good with a wide variety of crafts from around the country. Um, the local market is a local African market. So lots of, you know, a feast for the senses, lots of colors. And then um, we love to recommend guests uh, consider going to the paper craft uh, factory store or whatever. Um, you can see on the left there, all of your guests actually receive a craft from this, this company um, in the form of portfolio with all of their maps and their itineraries and, and, uh, and other information. So they you will come home with that really um, uh, very unique portfolio there and um, it is we buy them all from this from the papercraft um, project and it's really a, a very cool short visit they have other products as well they've just recently introduced um, natural soaps as you can see there um, recycled glass into wine glasses and vases they have um, other you know tons and tons of other paper crafts from note cards to um, other portfolios to menu covers. There's um, just, and it, and it all is ultimately, you know, benefiting local um, people and, and providing employment and doing good in, in recycling various materials from paper to glass and even more so. So it's, um, it's a fun craft visit, you know, an hour or so and, uh, and, and guests really do generally like it. And, and again, they also will be taking home um, a souvenir anyway um, from Classic as, um, as, as that portfolio. And then the last thing so we can get up to Murchison Falls is the Nagamba Island Chimp Sanctuary. We do get a lot of questions about this and um, people generally do know about it and ask about it. 
uh, I, I would say that um, it, they're doing great conservation work here. Um, the the sanctuary is home to, I think, roughly now about 49 orphan chimps that have been rescued from across East Africa, not just Uganda. They are a NGO, the Chimpanzee Sanctuary and Wildlife Conservation Trust, and um, they are in a great, you know, a great conservation and community education organization. We do think feel that for the the day trip, it tends to be a, a quite a bit of an expense for um, for not necessarily a, as good of an experience. Considering especially that you're likely going to see chimps elsewhere, um, you can do also do the chimp behind the scenes or the chimp close up um, at the uh, UWEC in Entebbe without having to have the expense of going across to the island as well as the, the time it takes. So um, there is an overnight experience as well, which generally is a little bit better. The chimps are more active and more visible in the mornings. So if you're staying overnight, you can generally see them and more of them. Um, however, the, the combinations are very basic uh, on the island. So a lot of factors there, but if you do have guests that are are asking you about it, certainly come through to, to Lindsay and team and, and they can give you, you know, their thoughts on it and, and recommendations. Um, but uh, it's generally something just for the day trip. We, we don't typically recommend just because of the cost of it. Okay, so we're going to jump in here on just sensitive of time. I'm going to try to get through Murchison and Falls in about 15, 20 minutes and then open it up for questions. Heading up to Murchison Falls uh, from Entebbe, like I say, it's, it's a, a full day's drive, you know, six to eight hours, depending on stops. The, the tarmac road is very good all the way up to Masindi, which is just on the border of Murchison Falls uh, Park. One of the stops that some people do ask about is the Ziwa Rhino Sanctuary, which is quite close to the park, but is, is something that um, if guests do want to see the big five in Uganda, this is the only place to see rhino in the wild, as it were. Um, the sanctuary is about 7,000 hectares, roughly 17,000 acres. So it is, you know, it is fenced and and um, it is a sanctuary, but in technically the, the rhino, the rhino are, are relatively wild. There are around 22 only white rhino. So the benefit of that is you can go visit them um, on foot, as you can see in that photo there. Um, it is a the the recommended times to see the rhino are generally like any wildlife earlier in the morning or late in the or later in the afternoon. Um, but you can do the walk at any time of day. It generally takes about an hour and a half to two and a half hours, depending on where the rhinos are. So it is, and Linz, I'll throw it over to you for any further thoughts, but I, you know, I think it is logistically feasible to make the stop along the way um, up to the park if people really do want to see the rhino. Um, yeah. But, yeah, no, we uh, do it. Yeah. yeah. We definitely do it. You don't have to stay there. Um, I think... Yeah, we, we get mixed feedback on it because I think sometimes the context is not fully explained to clients. You know, I think, I think you have to be really sensitive to the fact that it is a sanctuary. So yeah. if they're coming from, I don't know, somewhere like Sarara or somewhere in Kenya that has a lot of rhino, um, it's going to be really different. But if you want to get out and do it on foot, it's, it's well done, um, can be very, very muddy. And this is also, there's also shoebill in Ziwa. So it kind of just depends. Just let me know if you have, have people with specific interests. Um, and it's, it's something that we can work in pretty easily. All right. So now we're going to get into the park itself, Murchison Falls National Park. Um, it is Uganda's largest and oldest national park. It's about 1,400 square miles, um, which is, you know, a lot of, you've got the Budongo Forest in the south. I'll show you a map here, as well as um, savannah and grasslands um, in the north. And then it's bisected by the Nile River. And of course, the, its namesake here is the Murchison Falls itself, which is where the world's longest river um, explodes in this really violent cacophony of sound and fury. Um, in a narrow cleft about 20 feet across. The whole river is shoved into this narrow cleft and drops about 140 feet to the river uh, below. It's really an impressive sight. Um, and we'll talk more about how you can view that. It is one of Africa's and certainly Uganda's top birding destinations. You've got the shoebill there in the Nile Delta, plus another 450 species of birds. Generally very good game viewing, the big four, no rhino. Um, best game viewing is the northern part of the Nile, which we'll talk talk you through. The falls, of course, Murchison is here and Uhuru is the second falls over here. Um, 
And then the Nile, as I mentioned earlier, is one of Africa's great boating safaris. And, uh, and you will spend a lot of time on the Nile when you're up um, in Murchison Falls, it's unavoidable. This is the, the map, so we can give you a little bit of context and logistics. You would be driving up from Kampala or Entebbe through Masindi, which is kind of your last town, into the Badongo Forest, which is your initial entry into the park. Very thick, beautiful, I think it's the largest um, mahogany forest maybe left in, in Africa. I have to check my notes, but beautiful forest at the, at the beginning. Um, and then most of what most guests would see and, and where they would stay is actually right around the Nile River here, um, which, like I said, the Victoria Nile bisects the river before it empties out into to Lake Albert. It falls over here, and then your properties both on the south side of the Nile, which we'll talk through, and then a couple on the north side of the Nile, with the best game viewing being here in the northern sector of the park. So again, real quickly on birding, because this is again, Murchison Falls, one of the best birding areas. Uh, the Bodongo Forest is the largest remaining mahogany forest in East Africa, my, according to my notes, um, with trees that grow up to 80 meters high, which is incredible. Uh, and it also is a, really a paradise and, and probably the best area for birding in the country is, is this Royal Mile area within the uh, Budongo Forest. So guests that are twitchers, this is definitely a, a must visit. Um, and there's a whole host of, of birds, including endemic species that we can send to you if you have birders that wanna know more about why they would spend um, the time to do a birding trip in this area. Um, one of them is this elusive canopy dwelling, Ituri Batis, which is on, the, uh, on your screen there. If you are, if you do have guests that are going to want to do a birding trip in the in the forest in the Royal Mile, they will more than likely, if not, definitely have to stay either in Masindi Town or in the Badongo Forest. There's an eco lodge that Wild Frontiers runs there called the Badongo Eco Lodge. So they would want to spend a night there in order to then do the early morning trip for birding the next day. So again, just ask um, ask Classic and Lindsay if, uh, if you have guests that are keen. And then chimp trekking is also available in the Bodongo Forest. And uh, there are around 600 chimpanzees in the forest. I think about 80 or so have been habituated. There are plenty of other primate species as well. Um, the, the, the success rate is, is about 80%. Um, so a little bit less than Kabali Forest, which is you know, upwards nearly to 100%, 95%. Um, but still 80% is pretty good. And if you do have guests that are not going to Kibali, maybe they're just combining Murchison with either Queen Elizabeth or Murchison and Gwindi and they're skipping Kibali Forest, then we would recommend that they do do the chimp trek here um, because, uh, because you do have uh, you know, a pretty good chance. It's $80 for a permit here and generally it's a half day trip from one of the, the Nile River fronted uh, lodges. So, and again, Classic can tell you how best to integrate um, the chimp trek into your itinerary, it, but uh, it's generally a half day trip with, uh, with a packed lunch from, from the lodge. If your guests are doing Kabali Forest, where um, the chimps are more reliable and, and, and a higher percentage of, uh, uh, of seeing them, then we wouldn't recommend that you do it both in Budongo as well as Kabali. Zooming in a little bit to the map, most of the properties here right along the river on the south and north side. We're gonna talk today about Nile Safari Lodge, uh, Baker's Lodge, both on the south side, and then Para Safari Lodge on the north side, and Paguba, Pakupa Safari Lodge on the northern side, and a little bit farther north on the Albert Nile as well. We do recommend that guests spend at least three nights in Murchison Falls, just because A, of the drive to get up there, um, the distance to get up there, even if you're flying, you know, it is, a, it is you're going to get there in the late afternoon on, on day one, and really just, you know, um, decompress after your flight or your drive and relax at your lodge. The next day you would uh, more than likely be going up to do a top of the falls tour, which is what these pictures are of. And this is a really impressive site. Yes, Victoria Falls is incredible. Niagara Falls is incredible, but you really can't get as close to the Niagara Falls uh, or Victoria Falls as you can to the top of, of uh, Murchison Falls. And the sound and the fury of the water, it sounds like you're standing next to a 747 jet engine. I mean, it's absolutely incredible to witness the power of the falls and the power of this massive river being forced into this really narrow 20 foot cleft in, in the rock and then seeing it just cascade down 140 feet below. There's a video next, which I, I don't think is probably gonna work too well, so I'm gonna skip it, but I will send it out as, 
a link and you can hear the sound of the river in that video and it's uh, it's a video that I shot from this very vantage point and it's it's just incredible. We don't generally recommend people will ask about this as well you can you can do a, a walk up from um, below the falls to the top of the falls. We generally don't recommend that um, because this the trail is very steep uh, it's slippery it's very hot in that forest there are some tetsi flies in, in this area um, so it is it is generally not a particularly pleasant thing so more than you know more than likely we would really recommend your guests just do the top of the falls trip and that would be on the morning of day two let's say um, in I'm going to skip the video there and then the, the next two the next afternoon or that afternoon you would do one of the two um, boat trips, either the Nile boat trip um, or the Murchison Falls boat trip, which is the below the falls trip or going down into the Nile Delta. And in either of your two full days, you're gonna do uh, one boat trip upstream to the below the falls and another boat trip downstream to the Nile Delta. So you're gonna spend a lot of time on the river naturally here. This is the Nile River and, and there's a lot to see and incredible game viewing as well. There are shared boat trips um, as well as private and the boats can either be these big double deckers or a little bit smaller. Uh, it depends on the number of guests and if you're doing a shared trip you can't really sell you can't select which boat you want. Um, it depends on the number of packs that are booked. Um, if you do want to have a private trip which again Lindsay and, and the team can can let you know what the additional cost for that is. It's not considerably more expensive and you know I, I think it does give you a, a better general experience um, and again in the post COVID or or living with COVID era it uh, it may be an even more popular option um, but both the below the falls trip and the Nile Delta trip do um, offer private uh, private boats so that's always an option should your guest be interested in that and, and not want to roll the dice on a big double decker boat which is which is always a possibility but from the the, the river very good chance to see elephants as a large population of elephants I think 5,000 strong in Murchison Falls. And uh, at Paul Allen's great elephant census of a few years ago, Murchison Falls was actually one of the few bright spots with an increasing elephant population. So good chance to see quite a few elephants. Of course, birding is a big part of the experience um, that you will that you will have in, in Murchison Falls, the shoebill, um, your uh, crowned cranes, of course, the national bird of Uganda, fish eagles are all, all over the place. So uh, for birders, um, this is, is definitely a paradise. And then plenty of other games seen from, from the vehicles. You've got the huge uh, pods uh, of hippos, like I said, elephants, lots of big massive Nile crocodiles, black and white colobus monkeys and other primates up in the, in the tree canopy around um, surrounding the river. So it really is a, a game rich area. And then game drives as well. So on those two full days in the, in the park, you'll do a, a boat trip usually in the morning and that could be again the below the falls trip upstream or a Nile River Delta trip primarily to see the shoe bill and then the afternoons more than likely you'd be spent um, in a game viewing vehicle more most likely on the northern side of of the Nile uh, River because that really is more of the open savanna grasslands and where there is more game you have the big herds of elephants there you do have the Ugandan cobs uh, which are I think beautiful antelopes and the uh, Rothschild or Nubian giraffes. Um, I believe, and I don't have my notes here in front of me, but I believe there's about 5,000 Rothschild Nubian giraffes left in the wild and more than half of them are in Murchison Falls National Park. So a very interesting place to see um, a, a rare subspecies of giraffe. The Giraffe Conservation Foundation is also very active in the park and has actually translocated giraffe from the north side of the Nile to the south side. Um, where you, you can now see them, uh, as well as to Lake Mburo National Park um, down in the far south of, of Uganda. So they've done some great conservation work, and it is one of only three parks, Lake Mburo being the other, and Kadepo Valley being the third. So there's only three parks in Uganda where you do see giraffe. So if your guests aren't going to Kadepo or, or to Merch, uh, to Mburo, then this is, the, this is the place to see the, par uh, the giraffes. You won't see them in Queen Elizabeth National Park. A couple other activities available in Murchison. You've got a hot air balloon safaris, and there are, there's Phil and Mel doing a hot air balloon. I think that was actually shot in Queen Elizabeth National Park, but I wanted to, to show you uh, the, our, our two founders again enjoying themselves after their hot air balloon flight. Uh, Lindsay can advise on the cost of, of the, the hot air balloons. 
but um, it is an option in Merchants and Falls for guests that are interested in doing that. Night drives are also a possibility, but only generally on the north side. Um, you can do it on the south side, but there isn't as much game. So um, we do generally recommend the night drive only if you're staying in either Para Lodge or Pacuba, which are on the north side of, of the river. And that's in a, in a classic safari via classic Africa safaris vehicle with our driver guide and then a UWA representative, Ugandan Wildlife uh, Authority representative as well. I think that's about $150 to do the, the night drive additional charge. So plenty of other safari activities in the park. Another unique feature is, and I, which I haven't mentioned, is you do have to get across the Nile um, if you're staying on the south side. And there is uh, a ferry that has a schedule that we have to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, here's the last time I was there, the, the classic vehicle on the ferry. A bridge um, is being built or was being built. As to when that will be finished, um, we, we're not certain, but um, in the future that, that you may not have to worry about taking the ferry. But for the moment, and nothing your guests have to worry about, but there are some logistics. And it's also kind of a fun experience to, uh, to cross the river on, a, on, a, on an African ferry boat, which is um, primarily just for getting vehicles across. All right, we're gonna finish off here with the properties that we recommend in Murchison Falls and starting off with Baker's Lodge on the south side of the river. Um, they have 10 of these thatched tents, which are open air, obviously screened, but with mosquito nets, very comfortable. Um, right on the river level and uh, beautiful location. Very uh, kind of, you know, traditional African safari style with those, that open air um, view out over the, out over the Nile. Um, nice, the, nice, you know, generally I'd say four star accommodations here. Um, they don't have a pool, I don't believe, so not the best for families, um, but just a really solid option and, um, and one that we generally highly recommend. And was our number one option until recently when the Nile Safari Lodge was completely renovated. This was around, for those of you who've been in the industry for a while, you may remember the Nile Safari Lodge from years ago. Um, it fell into disrepair and was eventually closed and has recently in about uh, August last year, I believe, reopened and has been completely transformed into a five-star absolutely spectacular um, lodge. And again, Sam has that same location on the south side of the river in an elevated area. I'll show you a picture of the view, but it really does have a very, very special location, which makes it a um, pretty divine place to spend three nights. Um, big A-framed um, accommodation units with thatch. There are six of these standard ones. There's also a honeymoon suite that, uh, that has a star bed. Here's a picture of that star bed, as well as a private plunge pool. So for honeymooners um, and couples that wanna have a little bit more luxury and space um, and want to have a star bed experience just right on, on their, uh, right in front of their main deck or of their deck on their private, their private unit. This is a great option. And there's also a family suite as well that does have its own private plunge pool. So again, for the guests looking for more exclusivity, this is, is your best option. And certainly for those luxury um, travelers, this is definitely your best and your only five star option in the park. And here's the infinity pool in that amazing <laughs> location. Uh, elevated over the river where the pool just kind of connects and becomes one with the Nile as the sun sets. It's probably one of the best of sundowner locations um, in Uganda and certainly uh, one of the best in, in, in Murchison Falls. It just is a, a really special place to, to spend the night, especially now that they've upgraded the property. Now on the north side of the lodge, you have Para Lodge, which is um, your more traditional safari lodge, about 54 rooms, does have a pool, um, and it is, you know, it's, it's related to Mwea Lodge, which is in Queen Elizabeth National Park. Same idea, um, these old school traditional safari lodges. They haven't been upgraded in, in, a, in a number of years, so they're getting a little bit tired. Um, de depending on the level of room, you do have some air con in some of them. You've also got some um, uh, separate cottages and tents as well, again, for exclusivity. So. It's, um, it also does have a really nice location elevated up over the river with beautiful views. Um, and it, 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 again, if it's, if it's a budget consideration, this is a good option. Um, and if, if Dial Safari Lodge and or Bakers are not available, then, then PARA would probably be the next um, best choice. Um, just to give you, again, some logistics as far as where these properties are, Niles, or PARA Lodge here on the north side of, of the Nile Pakuba here on the far north, and this would be one that you would fly into um, Pakuba Airstrip instead of, 
Uh, Lindsay, you're going to have to help me with this one. There's a, there's a Bugungu. Bugungu there. I can yeah. barely make it out in the south if you're going to be staying in, the, in one of the southern um, side properties. And Pakuba and Lindsay, maybe just explain how you would integrate Pakuba because it is quite a bit farther north. Um, you would usually combine it with one yeah. of the, the other properties or on the way from Kadepo. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple options. If, if people are just doing Murchison um, unrelated to, to Kadepo, because you can come from Kadepo, fly up to Kadepo, do a full day drive um, over to Murchison, and either stay at the Chobe. Can you point at Chobe, please? Yeah, on the far Chobe right. over here. Um, and that's very far. Um, it's about a four hour drive from Chobe through the park to Para. Um, or, so Pakuba could be your first night in the park coming that direction um, after a forced overnight in Chobe. It's too far to go in one day. And you get the Albert Nile, you get, um, Mel was just, actually Mel and Phil were both just there earlier this year. And lots of game viewing immediately at the property. It's a very well-run, um, mid-range, kind of larger, um, you know, I don't know, think not quite as big as like a Sopa or a Serena, but, but that sort of feel. Um, if you flew into Pakuba, did a night there for, for pretty um, solid game viewing um, and through the plains and everything, then we can bring people down to the south side um, for the boat excursions as that's much closer on the, the Victoria Nile. Um, so something to consider, something different. Um, if pricing is an issue or because it's very affordable. Um, if availability space is a problem, then we can definitely use Pakuba and you can still get, it's about an hour, uh, give or take, depending on game viewing, down to the Victoria Nile for uh, boat launches. So logistically it works um, if we had to um, you know, sub, sub out, depending on space. Thanks, Linz. And yeah, just to explain as well some of the, the logistics of the different boat trips, since we have the map here in front of us, the Victoria Nile here drops off Murchison Falls and then heads out through the Victoria Nile Delta into Lake Albert and to the south, and then Al the Albertine Nile continues to flow north. So that's where Lindsay's talking about the Albertine Nile, the different, the other Nile, which is where Pakuba is located, all the other properties, Hurrah, um, and Nile Safari Lodge and Bakers are on the Victoria Nile. And then if you're doing what you would be if you're going here for, for three nights, two different boat trips. One of them, as I mentioned, is upstream to the base of the falls here. And the other is downstream to the Victoria Nile Delta. And this is where the shoe bill largely resides. Um, and then the northern part of the park up here is where, as Lindsay was just saying, the best game viewing is um, where the, the, you know, there's higher density of game um, and where we generally do most of our game drives. So if you're staying on the south side, you can still do that. Um, one, one way to do it is we'll, you do a Victoria Nile boat uh, Delta trip in the morning. Your guide then takes the vehicle across. Your classic driver guide takes the vehicle across and then meets you um, uh, where you disembark from the, from the boat. And then you continue to do a game drive here and then back across um, the ferry back to your property or to your accommodation on the other side. Again, the logistics of this is something that Classic has to work on. You don't have to, you don't personally have to worry about it and your guests shouldn't have to worry about it. It's something we do all the time, but the ferry does, um, does you know, present some logistical uh, considerations, but um, just so you have a, an idea of, of how this all works in the park. Just a, a quick note too, the afternoon, um, sorry, the, the base of the falls trip is always done in the afternoon. We don't do it in the morning because the way that the sunlight hits the falls um, in the morning, you can't see anything. So usually you would do game viewing in the morning and top of the falls visit potentially, and then afternoon um, boat launch to the falls. The Nile Delta um, is usually a morning boat launch, especially for birding. Right, great. And um, little known fact, Ernest Hemingway crashed his plane right here at the base of the falls back in the 1950s. Um, there's a great story and, and some actually New York Times articles written about it and then crash landed once, tried to take off again, crash landed again and was eventually uh, rescued. Um, if you're interested in those stories, I can send you the link to the, to the articles from the 1950s. But you do, I believe there's a little marker that shows crashed, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a cool little uh, trivia question there. 
So Pacuba, as Lindsay was explaining, and I'll just show you again, sorry, going back and forth here, but Cuba up here on the Albertine Nile, great game viewing, uh, mid, mid range property. I think there's 36 rooms, maybe 32 standard rooms and four family suites. Um, but you can see a very comfortable mid range accommodation. Um, and uh, as, as Lindsay said, Phil and Mel were there very recently and, and had good things to say, especially about the game viewing and very attentive staff. And they do have a pool as well, so it works for families. Um, and you know, it's, it's nothing spectacular to look at, but it is, it's a nice location and very comfortable property. And again, the game viewing, excellent. And then as Lindsay also explained, Chobe Safari Lodge, way in the far uh, east of the park, and that is primarily, you can't stay at Chobe and go out to Murchison. It's just too far, or if you can, it, it, it's not something we would recommend. And we generally do Chobe Safari Lodge for those guests that are, that are driving from Kidepo. So if you're combining Kidepo Valley way in the far north, which will be another deep dive, then um, you would uh, then be driving from there down to Murchison Falls. And because of the, the distance, you would stay a night at, at Chobe Safari Lodge, um, which, uh, Beautiful, as you can see, right along the river. Again, I think it's about 35 some odd rooms, more of your traditional safari lodge feel to it as well. All right, um, and here's that map, just so you can see what I'm talking about if you're coming from Kadepa Valley and you're heading down to Murchison Falls. Chobe is uh, somewhere up here, I think, in this area, um, in the park, so. Yeah, there's Chobe, the far east of the park. Okay, guys, that's it. I know we went on longer than, than promised, almost a full hour or so, uh, but it is a deep dive after all, so you really got to, to know Murchison Falls and, and Tebe. Um, just want to check on some questions here. Thanks for your attention and for, for, for sticking around for so long, um, and uh, feel free to add, uh, add any other questions that you may have, and Lindsay and I will, um, will answer. So um, the inevitable question, Lindsay, is uh, here about any inside information as to uh, whether the country will open before uh, access to primates do so. I think the question is, will Uganda open for other safari activities, but primates yeah. won't be, you know, will yeah. not be a, a possibility? Any info um, on that? You know, Karen, we don't have, they, they really haven't said anything. Um, Right now, as of, uh, I think it was May 4th, um, Museveni extended the lockdown order. They are not, um, I just had a really long call with Hilda about this uh, day before yesterday. They're not in kind of the typical stay at home slash shelter in place, like I am in Washington or California or whatever. It's, it's a pretty serious lockdown order. Um, we don't, have there are rumors circulating that all kinds of rumors about speculations on gorillas and chimps and primate trekking and when it will open and no official statement has been made um currently the borders are closed and the airport is closed um and previous to what i will call all of this hitting the fan um the ministry of health had made a statement um based on a category system and the US was banned from entry um, into Uganda as was the UK, um, it was about 15 countries. Um, whether the Ministry of Health will evolve that category system because this has really played out to such a greater level than I think anyone anticipated, um, we just have to wait and see. Um, I talked to Phil and kind of our personal take on it and this is, solely based on Phil and I chit-chatting, not anything from UWA or anything, they're probably gonna have to modify how gorilla trekking and chimp trekking takes place. Um, I think a lot of you have been to Greystoke Mahale. And you know, when I was there in 2006, we had to wear masks um, to, to track chimps. So perhaps something like that will happen. Perhaps they will change the numbers um, of people in the trekking families. Um, we just don't know. So we'll have to see and we will keep you posted. Um, but right now we are doing a lot of rescheduling. Gorilla permits can be rescheduled through March of 2022 at no additional cost. Um, for postponements, accommodations are being quite flexible. Cancellations, it's basically what you've been seeing other places in Africa. Cancellation terms have been modified in some cases. Um, some properties are sticking to their guns. Um, 
but postponements are very flexible. Classic is not charging any fees whatsoever on our side. It's only third party um, fees that would come into play. So we'll keep you posted. Um, but yeah, it may, Karen, it may be that, that safaris open up just because of the limited contact with primates. Um, we'll just have to see how that, how that plays out. Linz, just um, could you clarify in terms of the flights, uh, I believe they're minimum four up to Murchison Falls. Is that accurate? Yeah, it is. Um, minimum four for any day of the week. Um, you know, we've found that Aerolink, um, they are one of our preferred partners. Their terms and conditions are very interesting with the minimum. It's, it's only certain legs that are that minimum of four. And it has to be that there are four people flying on that exact route. So there couldn't be someone booked on the flight to Moya and they're just, you know, on the plane, they're just seat, you know, seat and plane. Um, but if they're not getting off when your packs are getting off, then Aerolink doesn't count it. So when I quote, those flights to Pakuba or Bagungu, you'll see, and I will base it on a minimum of four people. Um, and closer to the date, we can verify with the airline if anyone else is booked and we can make those adjustments accordingly. But in order to guarantee the flight, we have to calculate it based on four. And that applies then as well if, if people are continuing to fly from Murchison down to Kasesi for Queen Elizabeth or for Kibali or Queen Elizabeth, minimum yes. four. Yeah, it's only those two legs that, that, that are, are minimum, minimum of four. Yeah. yeah. But they the are now. flights are minimum of two, so. Right. Or sorry, no minimum. Right. But those um, those Murchison flights are now daily as well, because yeah. I believe it used to be like three days a week, so that's now daily, yeah. which is great. Hopefully They're daily, still... and we can, you know, something to keep in mind, though, is that um, if you if you prefer your packs to fly, if they're continuing down to Kibali after, the closest airstrip, there's not a functioning airstrip at Fort Portal. Um, so the closest airstrip is Kasese, which is two and a half hours-ish from the Kibali area lodges, which I know Tad will do another dive deep on that later, but Ndali, Chayaninga, all of those, uh, primate, papaya. So what that means is the classic vehicle will have to play catch up and the lodge will pick your clients up. Um, which, you know, we're working with preferred properties that we trust their vehicle quality and their ability to pick people up at an airstrip. Um, and then the classic vehicle will catch up later in the day because that, that drives about six and a half hours. Yeah, I actually did that the last time I was um, in Uganda was flew that, well, from, not from Murchison Falls, but from Entebbe to Kasesi and then was picked up by a, a Cheninga Lodge vehicle and driven to, to Cheninga as I was catching up with the fam trip who was coming down from Murchison Falls. And um, it was great. He was a very good, he was actually a guide um, who uh, had kind of, uh, was no longer doing, you know, uh, guides, you know, guiding around the country because he had a family and wanted to stay closer to Fort Portal. Um, so he was a, you know, a guide and transfer driver for Cheninga and gave me a lot of great information. It was a nice drive, um, like Lindsay said, two and a half hours. So, um, you know, so it's not not a bad, not a bad uh, transfer at all, and and it's very, you know, again the culture of by osmosis. You're going to see lots of of people in this area as you transfer from Kasesi up to Fort Portal, um, passing through small villages, and is is a pretty drive. So, it works pretty well. So generally, Lindsay, you would not do a fly in, um, to Murchison Falls, to and utilize lodge vehicles. You would always have yeah, a classic vehicle. That. Yeah, none of those accommodations. I mean, even Nile as the high-end accommodation, um, they don't particularly have what, what you would think of as like a fleet of safari vehicles. Like you could fly into, I don't know, say Syrian, Alex's camps in the Mara or whatever. Um, we don't really do that um, in Uganda. And a lot of it has to do with quality of guides. And, you know, historically there were not flights in Uganda. And so it didn't develop... Um, the same as somewhere like Kenya or Botswana where the guides on the ground at the properties are really well versed. Um, you're gonna end up with a situation of much more of kind of a transfer driver scenario and a lot of um, like Para has vehicles, but you're gonna end up um, in a shared game drive vehicle with limited mileage, you know, where literally the driver will hit a certain number of kilometers then turn around. Um, so it's just not, it's not what, 
what we do. Um, if people are doing, say, combining Murchison Falls with Wendy, um, we would deadhead the classic vehicle and flying in. We would deadhead the classic vehicle up, um, and then they would have a separate vehicle in in Buendi. Um and that you know the vehicle is going up anyway, so it works. Great, that's helpful. Cool. Um, I don't see any other questions. If you do have questions, feel free to email Lindsay or I. I will send out a follow up with a recording to the webinar. If if you missed any of it or you want to share it, you'll also find it on our uh, YouTube channel where we archive all of our webinars. You can always check there for the latest webinars that we've got. We will be doing a deep dive number two, which will be Kabali, either just Kabali or Kabali and Queen Elizabeth. We'll see. Um, and uh, so stay, stay tuned for, um, look out for you know, information on when that's going to be in the next couple of weeks or, or month. Um, and yes, Hadass, I will send the maps as well. I'll send you a link to our shared agent folder, which has all the maps um, in addition to the ones I showed today, as well as a bunch of other useful maps for other parts of Uganda. So I will send that follow up um, by the end of the week. One last question, maybe? No, you got it, Hadas. happy to help. All right, everyone, thanks again for spending so much time. I know we went a little bit long, but hopefully it was interesting and useful and you enjoyed a little diversion for an hour's time. Lindsay, thanks so much Thank you. for your, thanks, your insights and your knowledge. And um, we will be in touch with all of you soon. Take care, stay healthy, stay safe. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye.